right. Well, I want to welcome everyone, whether you're joining us in person or maybe you're watching online. Honored to have you guys with us. And I also want to take a moment, as I do every single week, it's one of my favorite things that I get to do, and that is say a big hello to all the men and women joining us in our correctional ministry, whether you're at CCNO right here in Northwest Ohio or across our nation or even in the country of Belize. We love you guys. We believe in you. Come on, D-Town. Help me welcome our church family today. Love you guys. Well, we are in our third week of our series called Faith That Pleases God as we're studying the life of Elisha, this incredible man of God who was bold, he was courageous, and he had a faith that pleased God. And really, I have one goal and one goal alone in this series, and that is to allow the teaching of God's word to build our faith. And so in week number one, we talked about plow burning faith and we learned that faith believes even when it doesn't see that that faith obeys even when we don't understand and that faith surrenders even when we'd rather hold on to it. Then last week in week number two, we talked about double portion faith and we asked God to pour out the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit upon our lives for God to anoint us so that we can live out his plan and his purposes. And today, the title of the message is Muddy Miracle Faith. And that's going to make a little more sense as we unpack uh, the story together. I hope you like God's word. I hope you love the word of God because we are going to dig into it today. And we're going to study a, a time, a, a story of a time when God did a miracle and it changed a man's life forever. Now, what's interesting is that Elisha's life shows up in two books of the Bible, 1 Kings and 2 Kings uh, in the Old Testament. But the story that we're going to study today is actually referenced in the New Testament in Luke chapter 4. Like it was such a significant story, uh, a story of faith that Jesus actually referenced back to it as he was addressing a group of people about their lack of faith. And before we kind of read this encounter with Jesus, let me give us some context as to what's happening in this story. Jesus is traveling back from a city called Capernaum back to his hometown of Nazareth. It's the Sabbath. And so Jesus goes to the synagogue or to church as was his custom. And during the church service, someone hands him a scroll for him to read some verses from the Old Testament. And they hand him the scroll of Isaiah. He enrolls it and he reads a few verses. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim that this is the year of the Lord's favor. Now, everything is, is going pretty standard uh, up until this point, but then Jesus says something that would have caused everyone's jaw to drop that were in the synagogue that day. He looks at everyone and says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled. And the Bible tells us that everyone in the synagogue, they were amazed. They were blown away. They were excited. But then the more they thought about it, they said, well, hold up. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the son of the carpenter? And take a look at what Jesus says next to him. Luke chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. In other words, that Jesus is saying, I already know what you're thinking. I already know what you're going to say. You're going to say, physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. And so what they're saying is, Jesus, we've heard about all the miracles that you performed in Capernaum, which was one of the cities where he performed the most of his miracles. And these people are saying to Jesus, we, we've heard about it but we aren't sure if we believe it. We want you to prove it, Jesus. We want you to prove it and do a miracle for us right here in our midst so that we can see for ourselves. Otherwise, we won't believe. 
Otherwise, we, we won't believe that you are who you say that you are and that you can do what other people said that you can do. And maybe, maybe we said something similar to, to God before. God, unless you do this for me, I won't believe. Or God, unless you do that for me, I won't believe. But I think it's important to point out that God will not be manipulated into doing what we want him to do. And at the same time, God doesn't have to prove anything to us. How many of us know he owes us nothing? He's God and we're not. Take a look at what Jesus goes on to tell these people in Luke chapter four, verses 27 through 29. Jesus said, and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman. Everybody say Naaman. And this is the, the story we're going to study together. Only Naaman the Syrian. Well, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Well, how furious were they? They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. Now, I don't know about you, but this seems like a little bit of an overreaction to me. Like, we didn't like what he said, and so we're going to throw him off a cliff. But my question is, why were they so upset? Why were they so mad? Well, Jesus is making the point that God's people are always missing God's miracles because they won't believe. I need God to do this in order for me to believe. I need God to do that in order for me to believe. And what happens when we have this kind of mindset is that we end up missing out on what God would have done. The Bible tells us that Jesus wasn't able to do hardly any miracles in his hometown of Nazareth because of their unbelief. And he's pointing out this story to them and trying to show them their lack of faith is actually hindering what he wants to do in their very lives. But I also think it's interesting that he, he references this story of Elisha and Naaman. This, this, this story of faith, this story of how God does miracles in response to our faith. And so let's read the, the story together. Are you guys ready? If you're ready, someone say, let's go. let's go. Second Kings chapter five, verse one says this. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. Now this would have been modern day Syria. He was a great man in the sight of his master, and Naaman was highly regarded. He was a great man. He was highly respected. Why? Because the way he carried himself, by the way he talked, by the way he lived, by the way he made decisions, he has earned the respect of the king. Not only that, but because through him, the Lord, let me say the Lord, the Lord had given him, given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but... He had leprosy. Let me point out two things from the beginning of this story. One, the Lord is using Naaman even though Naaman doesn't know God. How many of us know that God can use unsaved people to accomplish his purposes? That unsaved boss that you have, that unsaved coworker, that, that unsaved classmate, that unsaved neighbor, that unsaved community member. God can use unsaved people to still accomplish his purposes. And Naaman is a great example of that. He doesn't know the God of Israel, but that's all about to change by the end of the story because God's about to do a miracle in him and for him. He doesn't know God, but how many of us know God knows exactly who he is? Yeah. Secondly, I want to point out that the Bible tells us that he was a valiant soldier. I mean, this guy's brave. He's courageous. He's been victorious on the battlefield. This, this is a guy who's seen a lot of success in his career. He has a great reputation. He has the king's respect, but he has leprosy. He has influence, he has wealth, he has, he has power, but he, he has a problem he can't solve on his own. In other words, he needs God to do a miracle in his life, which I just want to point out to us that every single one of us at some, uh, some time in our lives are going to face a situation or a circumstance or a problem we can't fix. 
where there's a problem we don't have an answer for. It's out of our control. There'll be a diagnosis. There'll be a, a struggle in our relationships. We'll experience a problem when I don't know how to fix it. I don't have the power to make this thing go away. This, this guy has, has money. He has influence. He has wealth. He could go to the king. If he could fix it on his own, he would. But he needs God to do a miracle in his life. Now, leprosy, just so we're all on the same page, is this disease where eventually, uh, when it gets aggressive, your limbs start to fall off, your skin begins to deteriorate, and it causes a very slow death. And so Naaman has an influential position, but he doesn't have the power to cure his problem. Naaman gives us a picture of someone who has everything they want, but not everything they need. Maybe some of us can relate to to him today. Maybe some of us are, are facing a physical battle. Maybe there's been a diagnosis. Maybe there's a medical condition. Maybe there's something that we are, are fighting and the doctors really don't have any answers. Maybe there's a pain, there's a discomfort, and we need God to do a miracle in our lives. We don't have the answers for what the problems that we're facing. But on another note, maybe some of us can relate to Naaman in the way that from the outside looking in, everything on the outside looks like things are going well. I mean, if you looked at Naaman's life, I mean, he's, he's a successful commander in this powerful army. He's, he's, he's in good with the king. He's living in the palace. He's got wealth. He's got influence. He's got power. I mean, from the outside looking in, this guy must be nice to have this guy's life. Must be nice to be that guy. And, and scholars believe that his leprosy wouldn't have been too far along in the stages in his progression, that he might have had some, some, some issues on his skin, some spots on his skin, but that he would still be able to cover it up. He'd still be able to function. So it shows us a picture of someone who has every, it looks like they have, everything is going great, but there's some areas of his life that, that aren't going so, so great. Maybe we can relate to that. On the outside, it looks like, Everything is fine, but on the inside, there's some things that we, we need God to do in our lives. And I just want to say to all of us today that you're coming to the right place. N- not necessarily experienced church. I-, I don't mean that. I-, I mean the God of the Bible who has the ability to heal, has the ability to deliver, has the ability to redeem, has the ability to set free. G- How many know we serve a God who still does miracles? And so let's continue reading our story Together today, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 2 through 3. It says, Now bands, battle of the bands from Aram, had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only. Everybody say, If only. The slave girl said, If only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. You know, as we study the story together today, I want to give us three things that you need to know about the miracle you need. If you're taking notes, the the first thing that we need to know about the miracle we need is number one, is that faith can accelerate our miracle. Faith can accelerate our miracle. This girl who had been taken as a slave said, if only... In other words, she just spoke what she knew. I don't know how you're going to do it, God. I don't know when you're going to do it. I don't know what it's going to look like. But if only, if only this, if only Naaman could see this prophet in Samaria, God could heal him. God could do a miracle in his life. I don't know how, God. I don't know when. I don't know what it looks like. But if only he could have an encounter with you. I don't know about you, but I'm a product of somebody else's prayers. I'm a part of someone else's prayers who said, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what it looks like. In fact, if I looked on the outside, it doesn't, God, Kyle needs a miracle. But if only you could get a hold of his heart. If only you could, could, could speak to him. If he could only have an encounter with your presence and with, with your love. God, you could do a miracle in his life. And I'm so grateful that I was surrounded by some people who had faith in God, not in what they saw in my life, but they had faith in a God who still does miracles because I'm a product of their if only faith. I'm a product of their faith. And if you're praying for God to do a miracle in somebody else's life, I just want you to know today, your faith can accelerate their miracle. Now we never find out what this slave girl's name is. All we know is that she's from Israel. 
that she's a slave in a foreign country, that she's been kidnapped from her home. She's been taken as a prisoner of war. She's been separated from her family who may or may not even still be alive. And she finds herself serving Naaman's wife. I point this out for for two reasons. One, that God still works all things together for for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And here this slave girl is going through some difficult moments of her life, but how many of us know God still had a purpose and God still had a plan? And I don't know who needs to be reminded of that today. You're going through some difficult times. You're going through some difficult circumstances. God still has a purpose and God still has a plan. God still has a purpose and God still has a plan. God still has a purpose and God still has a plan. The second reason I I point this out is because knowing what has happened in her life, it makes her statement of faith that much more powerful because she could have been resentful. She, she could have been bitter. She could, she could have been hateful. She could have said, ha, 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 what goes around comes around, Naaman. That's right, buddy. I'm glad you have leprosy. After what you've done to me and my family, you deserve to have leprosy. She, she could have said that, and none of us probably would have faulted her for feeling that way, but that wasn't her response. Instead, this girl chooses forgiveness which shows us a couple of things about faith, not in your notes. These, this is, we're in a bonus section of the message today, but it shows us a couple of things about faith. You can write this down, and that is, that is simply this, that faith is impossible if our hearts aren't right. Faith's impossible. That's why throughout Scripture, the Bible is constantly talking about making sure that we guard our hearts above all else, for it's the wellspring of life. David prayed this prayer in Psalm 139. God, if there's anything in my heart that doesn't belong, point it out to me. Show it to me, God, so I can deal with it and get rid of it. After David sinned and and he knew his heart wasn't right, he wrote Psalm 51, and it opens up by saying, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Because faith is impossible if our hearts aren't right. The second thing we we, we learn from this, this slave girl is that faith is impossible if what has been done to us is larger in our minds than what God will do for us. If our past is bigger than our future, it's gonna we're gonna have a hard time having faith. This girl has been through some of the most difficult moments of her life, and yet she had the faith to forgive, which gave her a purpose that was bigger than her pain. I mean, think about it. This girl is the least influential person, not only in the story, but probably in the entire nation. She's a slave girl. Like, why would anybody listen to her? She had to have thought, man, why even open my mouth? Why even say anything? No one's going to listen to me. Have you ever felt like that? Why even pray? It's not going to change anything. Why go to church? It's not going to make anything different. Why why even do that? Nothing's going to be different. It's not going to change anything. I just want to remind us, man, there there is a power that is active when we, in faith, speak words of faith. When we speak words of faith to ourselves, Come on, sometimes we need to speak some faith over ourselves. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what I see. I I just need to start saying, I need to start saying what God's saying over me. I'm gonna start speaking words of faith over my life. I'm gonna start speaking words of faith to other people. And when I pray, I'm gonna start praying words of faith and faith-filled prayers over people because there's a power that is active when I say, I don't care how I feel. I don't care what I see. God, I'm siding with you. I'm choosing to agree with what you said. Something happens in our midst. This girl, man, she had a bold faith. She had a courageous faith. She spoke words of faith that accelerated a miracle in somebody else's life. I mean, think about that. I mean, it's one thing to have faith for yourself, but it's a whole nother thing when you have faith for someone else. Let's continue reading this story. You guys are all fired up. Chill out. Second Kings chapter five, verses four through five says this, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. Pause there. Notice the two most influential and powerful men in the entire nation are now quoting this slave girl. Think about the power of speaking faith-filled words. They're quoting this slave girl and they're not only just quoting her, 
They're listening to her. They're going to do it. The king says, by all means, go. The king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And so Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of of clothing. Now, just so we have an understanding of what Naaman is taking with him, this would have been around 150 pounds of gold, which according to Friday's market was worth around $4.8 million just in gold. This would have been 750 pounds of silver, which once again, according to Friday's market was worth $270,000. Then you have the 10 sets of, of clothing, which would have been extremely valuable back in that day as clothes were. And so Naaman is bringing over $5 million to pay for his healing, which I just want to point out isn't faith. It's actually unbelief. You see, unbelief thinks you get what you pay for. Unbelief says you have to earn it. Unbelief says, I'm a good person who tries to do good things. And because of what I've done, maybe God will do something for me. But church, that's not faith. That's unbelief. When we put more faith in what we've done than what God has done, that's not faith. That's unbelief. The story goes on in verse 6 of 2 Kings chapter 5. It says this, as the letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? Well, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and they stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Now, I just want us to picture what is happening in this part of the story. This is a huge entourage that has just showed up in front of Elisha's house. Naaman is a general in the Assyrian army. He's in enemy territory. And so he's not just showing up by himself. In fact, scholars believe that there would have been at least 600 soldiers with him. So you got 600 soldiers, you got horses, you got chariots, all pulling up in front of your house. And maybe you can't picture what this looks like, but I can because I've had the SWAT team. I've had police officers pull up in front of my house. I've been looking through the, the blinds like, oh, what do I do? Anybody? Where are my people at? Where are my people at? <laughs> Praise God for his forgiveness. Come on. Praise God that he can deliver. He can heal. He can set free. I'm so glad that I don't have to look out my window and be worried about who's outside. But Elisha, I mean, I just wonder what he's thinking in this moment when this huge entourage pulls up in front of his house. Take a look what happens. Verse 10, 2 Kings chapter 5. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Boom, shaka, laka. I mean, there it is. The whole reason he went to Israel in the first place, instructions to be healed, the manuscript for his miracle. I mean, they don't even waste any time. There's no small talk. They don't talk about the weather. Elisha doesn't even come out of the house to greet Naaman. He sends a servant out that tells him, just go and do this and you will be healed. Simple straightforward and not much different that if you need a miracle or if you need God to do something in your life, step out of your seat and come down front and join your faith with somebody else's faith and pray for God to do the impossible in your life. But for whatever reason, we don't always step out of our seats. In fact, after service today, at the end of service, we're going to take some time to just pray for God to do miracles. We're just going to believe. We're going to have the faith to say, God, you still do miracles. And I don't know how, and I don't know what it looks like, and I don't know when, but if only, if only, if only, I still believe you're a God who does miracles. And, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to step out of your seat 
and come down and believe God to do the impossible. Maybe you're in your life or maybe just like that slave girl to do the impossible in somebody else's life. But I had an encounter after first service. I just want you to know I was at the front doors and Doug and Margaret were trying to leave the service and Margaret, they're an elderly couple and Margaret goes, hey, we got to get Doug up to the front. I go, what do you mean? He's like, he's got cancer. He's had lung cancer for 10 years. He's had 75 treatments. He just had his 75th this past week. We got to get him up to the altar. I said, Doug, you trying to leave today, boy? You trying to leave on me? Gotcha, Doug. Get the lead pastor out on the front. The door is so close, Doug. You're 10 feet from the front door, but I got gotcha. you. Let's pray right now. And I wrap my arm around Doug and meet Doug and Margaret right there in the lobby after first service. Prayed for God to do the impossible in Doug's life. So I'm just saying, you can come down to the front after service or I'll meet you in the lobby. Either way, we're going to pray a prayer of faith to ask God to do the impossible. Are you with me? I don't even know where I'm at in my message now. (laughs) Doug messed me all up. There's this miracle. He's got the instructions right there. But for whatever reason, we don't always step out and just do the simple things that God is calling us to do. And that's what that's the mistake that Naaman starts to make. Look at it. Second Kings chapter five, verse 11. But Naaman went away angry. If he would have been driving a car, uh, he would have squealed his tires and drove away angry. And he said, I thought Everybody say, I thought. I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. The second thing I want us to know about the miracle we need is number two, write this down, and that is pride can cause us to miss our miracle. Pride can cause us to miss our miracle. It's a funny thing about pride, isn't it? Like when our hearts are full of pride, we try to write our own prescriptions. Like if this would just happen or if I could do that. But what if God isn't going to heal us on our terms? What if God isn't going to set everything up to be convenient for us? What if the command that God gives to us is to do something that seems insignificant or seems foolish or even maybe just maybe seems embarrassing? I don't want to go up front. What will people think about me? What what, what will people say if I step out and do that? What if God gives us something to do that even seems beneath us. Naaman said, the Jordan River, that muddy river, and he walked away angry. And then he said two words that have got every single one of us in trouble. I thought. I thought. You know how many times these two words have stood in between me and peace? I thought. Thought. You know how many times these two words have stood in between me and joy? I thought, how much longer are we going to allow these two words to stand in between us and the miracles that God wants to do in our lives? Like, what if God just wants to do it a different way? What if God wants to do it in a process, not a moment? What if God wants to take us on a journey because there's more that he wants to do in us? Instead of just snapping his fingers in a moment, he wants to take us on a journey. It's a process, not maybe a moment. Naaman expected it to go a certain way. I thought he would surely come out to me. I thought he would just wait. He would call on the name of the Lord. I thought he would just wave his holy hand over me and that he would cure me of my leprosy. But what if God wasn't just wanting to heal Naaman's skin? What if God also wanted to heal Naaman's heart? And verse 12 tells us in 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman responds by saying, Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? In other words, I have my preferences. I've got my plan. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? Like, do I really have to go to the mommy or the Oglays? That muddy, nasty, I don't know about you, but I've seen multiple fish with three eyes in the mommy. I'm just saying. He's like, I got to go to the mommy. And the, there's so many other better rivers and lakes around, so much cleaner. You want me to go? This doesn't make any sense. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? And so he turned and he went off in a rage. 
He went off in a rage. He's about to go home unhealed because he was unwilling to be humbled. Pride can cause us to miss our miracle. Humility opens the door for God to move in our lives. Naaman, Naaman is trying to make sense of God's word instead of just submitting to God's word. And I just want, I, I, I really felt this in my heart for us today that, that some things we're not going to understand on this side of the miracle. They're just not going to make sense on this side of the miracle. I think of the, the nation of Israel when God delivered them after 400 years of slavery and bondage and oppression in the land of Egypt. And, and God led them to flee Egypt and go to the Red Sea, which they had mountains on both sides. Which they had the Red Sea in front of them. And then the Egyptian army was closing in on them behind them. In other words, it looked like a dead end. It looked like, God, why would you, why would you say to come here? This, is, this doesn't make any sense. But as the wind began to blow throughout the night and the waters began to part and the, and the ground be, began to become dry and they walked over to the other side and they turned around only to see the Egyptian army try to follow, the waters come back, killing all of their enemies right in front of them. How many of us know it made a lot of sense on this side, but it didn't make much sense on this side. And some things we're just not going to understand this side of the miracle. And I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing, but I'm saying it's not going to make sense right here. But if you'll just keep trusting, if you'll just keep believing, if you'll humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. And as you get to the other side of the miracle, you look back. And you see now what you didn't see then. I see something now that I didn't see then, but I was never going to see it unless I just kept putting one foot in front of the other and trusting God to go into places I've never been. I mean, if you just want to continue on with the nation of Israel, after that encounter, they spent another 40 years wandering in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And God provided manna every morning. And then they had to drink water out of rocks. And they complain and they're like, why do we have to do this, God? This doesn't make any sense that we have to trust you in the wilderness every single day for our provision. We have to drink water out of This doesn't make sense, this side of the miracle. And God says, no, I'm taking you to the promised land. And as they cross over the Jordan River into the promised land where they would have to fight 31 kings and their armies, armies that were bigger, armies that were stronger. They can look back and go, wait a minute. Now it makes sense why I had to eat manna. Now it makes sense why I had to drink water from a rock. Because if I could trust you back then for provision, if I could trust you back then for protection, now I see something now that I didn't see before. And now I understand this side of the miracle that you want to give us the promised land. And all of a sudden they went places they'd never been before. It didn't make sense in the wilderness. It didn't make sense then, but it made sense now. The same thing is happening with Naaman. You see, Naaman, Naaman is about to go off because he thought he had a better plan. Thank you, Jesus, for all the times that we wanted to go off, but God intervened and he kept us from making a huge mistake. Anybody else grateful for the times we almost quit, for the times we almost walked away, for the times we almost gave up, but God sent somebody, I don't know about you, he sent people in my life to interrupt my plans and to intervene on my behalf. And the same thing happens for Naaman. Take a look, verse 13 and 14, 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman's servant went to him and said, my father, sir, dude, if the prophet had told you to do something great, what if you not done it? How much more than when he tells you to wash and be cleansed? I love Naaman's response. He humbles himself. And so he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times just as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and he became clean like that of a young boy. The final thing I want us to, to know about the miracle we need is number three, and that is obedience can release our miracle. Can I just remind us today that God doesn't just want to cure our condition or fix our situation, but he wants to make us whole on the inside. Naaman came for your cure, but he went home cleansed. And sometimes what we come, come for is not always what we leave with. And so Naaman went down. He humbled himself and he obeyed and he went down in the muddy waters, which was the only way 
he was going to get healed. He dipped seven times in the muddy, glaze mommy river. This river that meant so much to the nation of Israel, but it didn't mean anything at the time to Naaman. But how many of us know after that day, the Jordan River meant so much more to Naaman. It meant something different. And he dipped seven times. Think about it. The first time he dipped, he came up out of the water. Nothing got better. And then he dipped a second time and he comes up out of the water, but his spots still look the same. The third time he dipped, he comes up out of the water, his skin didn't change. The fourth time he dipped, nothing happened to indicate that he was doing anything right. The fifth time he dipped, his situation was the same. And the sixth time he dipped, I wonder if he came up and thought to himself, man, did the prophet Elijah send me down here just to make a fool out of me? But I think God wants to know if we'll trust him enough to stay in the process even when we can't see any proof. Well, I just stay in the process even though I can't see any proof. Well, I just keep dipping, keep obeying, keep trusting, keep believing. Just stay in the process even though I can't see any proof. Maybe some of us, we've dipped once. We prayed a couple times. We've asked God to do a miracle. We've asked God to, to help us and nothing seems to be happening. I just want to encourage us today. Keep dipping. Keep doing what God is calling you and telling you to do. Don't stop after four. Don't stop after five. Don't stop after six. Complete obedience releases our miracle. And after the seventh dip in the Jordan, completely obeying what God told him to do through the prophet Elisha, his flesh was restored. And this great man, this great man came out of the Jordan like a young boy. Muddy, miracle, faith. I don't know about you, but I admire Naaman because he completely obeyed even when he didn't understand. But I can also relate to Naaman because he almost walked away. And there have been many moments in my life where God has spoken something to me that almost seemed too easy. It almost seemed too simple to let something go that I was holding on to, to, to go, go to somebody and take responsibility for something that I did or to own a behavior or habit that I was trying to, to justify and minimize. But what I discovered much like Naaman is that the cleansing comes in the process. It comes when we get down in that muddy water and we realize that in order for miracles to happen, we need faith, we need humility, and we need obedience. Would you pray with me today? Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that you're a God who still does miracles. We thank you for this story that stirs our faith. That maybe, just maybe, if you did it for Naaman, you would do it for me. If you use this slave girl to say, if only, the faith of this little girl Maybe you could use my faith to heal somebody else and do a miracle in their life. And right now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, can we just pray this prayer? Say, speak, Lord. I'm listening. How do you want me to respond to the message today? Because I don't want to just be a hearer of your word, God. I want to be a doer. I want to apply your truth to my life. And right now in this place, I'm going to give every single one of us an opportunity that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never sur surrendered your life to Jesus, maybe you're watching online. God's speaking to you right now. There's more to this life than what you're living. It doesn't come from better behavior. It doesn't come with greater church attendance. It doesn't come with any doing any religious thing, even though those are great things. It comes from having a relationship with Jesus. We surrendered our life. Here I am, God. I've tried doing it on my own, and I realize that you are the way. You are the truth and you are the life. And here's my heart, God, what you've always wanted. I want to follow you all the days of my life. If you need to make that decision or you walked with God at one point in time, but you've drifted, come on, today is your day. I want you to lift your hand to heaven right now where you're at. Say, God, here I am. I want to know you, God. I want to have a relationship with you. That I believe, God, that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that I could have a life I never thought possible. 
And right where you're at, would you just pray this prayer with me? Say, God, thank you for your love that never fails. Thank you for loving me right where I'm at, but loving me enough not to let me stay there. Right now, in this place, here's my heart. I give you my life, God. God, forgive me my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to live. My life is yours. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Come on, let's stand in this place because we're not done. We're going to go back into a time of worship. And if you need God to do a miracle in your life, if you're believing and you're asking God to do something in your life, I want to invite the prayer team to come join me down front. Come on, let's join our faith together in this place. Maybe you're standing in the gap for somebody. You're believing for God to heal, for God to restore, for God to do a miracle in somebody else's life. Come on, come on, step out of your seat, come down. Let's join our faith together. Let's believe, let's ask, let's cry out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that God would do what only He can do. Come on, let's lift our hands in this place. Come on, lift our hands as a sign of surrender. Surrenders starts the process and God doing miracles in our lives. Father, we surrender our hearts to you today, God. We surrender our lives. Do what only you can do. We worship you in this place. We love you in Jesus' name.